welcome to Fosbury Flop, a podcast for the crazy ones who are not fond of rules. A podcast about the geniuses who change the world. Wolfgang Scholhorn is the creator of one of the most influential pedagogical theories of all time, the differential learning theory. He published it after leading different German athletes to success. The theory opposes the repetition of movements based on ideal movement patterns. To succeed in uncertain contexts as a sport, one needs to know how to adapt to every situation. This is what differential learning does. It teaches you to constantly adapt. There is evidence that shows that works better than traditional training models. It is used by Tuchel, Klopp and Guardiola, among many others. Perhaps even you, without knowing it, apply Wolfgang's theory. If you don't apply it, wake up. You might be late. Hello, uh, Wolfgang. Thank you very much. And welcome to Fallsbury Flop. Yeah, welcome. Nice to meet you. It was a, a pleasure to meet you a few weeks ago. And today it's a really big honor to have you in, in Fosbury Flop. We will see about this after the uh, talk. <laughs> I loved one of your, your sentences once I heard about you, that you said, my theory reflects my life. So my, my first question is how your life has been that we have ended up re recording a podcast called uh, Fosbury Flop. Um, okay, I'll try to put it simple. I think I was always curious, and curiosity means you always want to know something new. And as soon as it was a repetitive thing, uh, actually, it was no more interesting for me. And this was um, related in school. This was uh, also in sports. And okay, here we are in sports. Uh, so. Uh, I started with as a gymnast. Uh, at this more, uh, time, I became too tall, so I had to switch. Um, I went. Uh, I be uh, began to play handball. I played in, in a state team, uh, but there I was too ambitious and uh, hurt my knees because we only we always had to play on concrete. Uh, by the way, I was um, yeah almost on jump to national team, but uh, then I recovered for about two years my knees and while recovering i met a couple of track and field athletes and they convinced me to start with javelin because i was a handballer and as a javelin thrower you should be able to throw discus and shot put and then i already had one third of a decathlon so i switched to decathlon and became again member of the state team in decathlon and while Doing decathlon, I became interested in bobsleigh. Uh, so I started bobsleigh, and within a very short time, I became German champion and vice European champion in the juniors. And while I did this, I was already earning my money as a coach and had the chance to apply all my, I would say, studies in, uh, during the day to my athletes which I was coaching in the evening. And I saw a lot of discrepancies between theory and practice. And very often the coaches were talking the right thing, but the practice was completely different. And this is actually what I saw in a lot of theories as well, and, and also in a, a couple of parallel theories, um, which I met in the beginning of, of this journey. And um, this was also for what I see meanwhile in, in a lot of podcasts, that they just take over the theory without being uh, aware of all these contradictions which are behind these theories. So in order to test this, I met a friend uh, and told him, I want to learn a new sports where I didn't have any experience in, um, but I want to see this coach only once a week. And this was uh, the national coach in karate in Germany. So I started to learn karate. And uh, yeah, with, and within two years, only with differential training, 
uh, I got the, the black belt almost. So I knew that this is going to work. I, then I applied this to my athletes. Um, three of them became German champion, German, German junior champions. And then later I started to look for the theory, to bring theories together. And yes, I studied sports, I studied physics, I studied uh, pedagogy and, and uh, also neurophysiology. And then I brought all the theories together uh, to explain what I was uh, applying already for more than 15 years. And this was the differential training theory. And, and uh, yes, 1999, I um, made a couple of predictions, which all were, meanwhile, uh, not all, a lot of them are still open, but uh, all of the predictions were verified scientifically. And yes, um, some of this literature I sent to colleagues to help me to get this published. And uh, they took this over, renamed this, and uh, so sold this uh, with another name. But meanwhile, they are shifting more and more uh, to my explanation uh, without using my name. So the Chinese would say, that's the highest uh, way to acknowledge someone if you copy the things. Uh, but yes, when you don't understand the basics, then you can just copy the surface. Uh, you can only make progress if you know the principle behind this. Uh, and I would say the wits, and this is why we see all these phenomena now in uh, in the brain area, we see, we see it in, in the heart uh, area, we see this in, in pedagogy, we see this in disease, we see this in, uh, in all the areas where we start to apply this, it's successful. And I don't know, I don't know many theories which were able to do this. You were the, the creator, the, the father of differential learning theory. And it was a theory, no, that I understood it came from practice. You apply it and then you research it for facts to prove it. Yes. Yes, this was the case. Uh, at this, the, uh, the very beginning was actually, okay, I was a decathlete and my first job I um, uh, got as a sprint coach. Now for the athlete, only sprinting is very boring. Uh, mainly uh, reduced, okay, you have to sprint, sprint, sprint. And when you run 200 meters, you need someone who is telling you, you have to take left turn, left turn. Uh, <laughs> so I met, um, I had um, juveniles, they were 14 years old, full of testosterone. Uh, they didn't know where, where to spend their energy uh, with. So I promised them or I made a contract with them. Okay, I will train you three to four times a week, but we will never have any uh, uh, training session the same. And they were looking like this because they were already used to, to train four or five times and they had a lot of repetitions in there. Uh, yes, and I started with this. Uh, they had a lot of fun and the group increased. Uh, at the end, I think I had 24 uh, boys and girls in my group. Um, I could um, juggle uh, them um, quite good. Uh, yes, and within, I would say, two years, I had a first term champion uh, in, in sprint. Then uh, one year later, uh, the female became term champion in hurdle sprint. And four years later, uh, the decathlete became term champion um, uh, also in, in the juvenile area. And the characteristics of all of them was that they were very thin, uh, but very well coordinated. And this is what I always did. I observed nature. And my first question was, um, okay, did you ever see uh, a cheetah, which are the fastest animals, doing squats and bench press? No, and when you look, look to when you look to nature, then you see actually that the fast animals are thin, and this was the, the advantage of mine that I did my PhD in, in biomechanics, so I knew a lot about uh, muscle biomechanics as well, and when you know this muscle biomechanics, then it's mainly about how to cause corresponding coordination to get the the highest force out of the existing muscle, and. This is uh, mainly the basis of differential learning. The, I think later we will uh, dig into the 
I, th I think it's much more than proven that differential learning has much more benefits than traditional learning or about your PhD on... on... Meanwhile, I would say um, in maturity, but what I'm much more interested uh, almost is uh, those people who do not respond directly. There are some, but this is another problem. We can talk about this later. Okay. Also, but yes, like... you're right. In maturity... It uh, all the studies show that it works better. Yeah, and and, and we have seen that professional coaches use it. You have used it, and you had German champions. But but I wanted to ask you about the what you said about the basics, the background behind the theory. What was your main principle behind uh, differential learning? Okay, the first thing is um, I mentioned this already: biomechanics. So. By mechanics, you need to know about, I would say, principles of movements. But even already there, um, we started to see a much finer structure by methods which I learned in physics, uh, which are associated with pattern recognition. So my doctor father told me, hey, you are the Catholic, please uh, find the role models for all the 10 disciplines. And yeah, to be honest, after 10 years, mm, I failed. Um, and you, okay, you could say I, fa uh, I failed, but uh, you could also say, and this is what I chose, uh, this is the wrong question. Because what we found is that there is no role model for everyone. We could identify exactly the world-class shot putters, uh, Werner Günther, uh, Ulf Timmermann, uh, Udo Bayer, which were all doing the shot put for 23 meters. And we, we analyzed them in, in uh, Olympic Games and uh, World Championships. And we really could say after the first approach already, who is doing the shot put movement? And then you get a fundamental uh, problem with classical approaches. So whom of those am I choosing for my role model? And what became even worse is that uh, when you record them several times, none of these rec uh, recordings were, were identical. So they always changed. So even if you would have uh, chosen uh, one of them as a role model, which of these uh, trials would, would have been the, the best? So physics was uh, the first base. And then I was looking in another area to physics, which is related to uh, systems dynamics. Uh, and uh, yes, you can do mm, f systems dynamics in a physics way, or I would say by mechanical way, where you analyze the dynamic or kinetic of a movement and how this is going to change. But for me, it was more interesting to look to the neuronal part because biomechanics is providing, I would say, a perfect diagnosis, but it doesn't help you to, to tell the athlete how you should change now. Now, the classical model is you're recording world-class athlete, you have an advanced athlete, and then you're trying to copy them. But how to do this is a big question. And this was one of the, the key um, informations in systems dynamics, that they are considering uh, the fluctuations of living systems. This was one part. But the second part was that before they switch from one state to another, they increase the fluctuations enormously. And in a more abstract uh, terminology, this means from a stable state to an other stable state, you have to pass an instability. Now, the most people, and uh, still uh, one of the colleagues, are still observing this and describing this. Now, when you describe a movement with a differential equation, it's like, okay, you could describe this also in Russian language. It's just changing language, but actually it doesn't help. Or in medicine, we know, when you know the name of a medicine, uh, of, a, of a disease, it doesn't help you how to treat the, 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 the disease. So this was for me the chance, okay, seeing the, the fluctuations. And when you see a fluctuation or an intermittency, then it's telling us that there is the, stable, the system instable and there is potential to learn. So instead of making the instability smaller, I said we have to increase the instability because then the system is completely getting unstable, and then it's easier for
for them to find a new thing by themselves. And this is actually the principle of self-organization. So we add a lot of noise to the system. We don't tell them how it has to look like. And there's a big difference to other approaches which are talking about self-organization, uh, but actually it's not, because they have advices how the solution should look like. Also, when you tell the, the, the athlete, you have to experience the error to experience what is wrong, then you give them information how it should be. And this was one major reason why we started in the beginning. No repetition and no correction. Because when you correct someone, you are pretending to know what is correct, but this is what we don't know because it's very individual and it's always changing. And there's a big difference. And, and actually, the other thing is nothing else than what have been, has been uh, told already in reform pedagogy in, in the 18th, 19th century. It's guided discovery. So you set some, some borders, uh, and, and within these borders, uh, the athlete can do whatever they want. And actually, this was, I would say, one misinterpretation uh, when I uh, suggested this the first time in, in uh, Barcelona to uh, Keith Davids and Duarte Arouche, and uh, also uh, Duarte Arouche invited me to Lisbon, and I showed them how differential learning can be applied in game theory. So we started with a very small field, we increased the field, and by increasing the field, the athletes uh, moved faster and faster, and so they adjusted immediately without telling them what to do. And exactly those games, which I suggested them there, are now sold in another theory as da-da-da. I don't want to mention it, but, but I think you know what, what I mean. But this started already in 2003, and they just renamed this, and this is why it, I would say it went into a dead-end street, because they didn't understand the basics for this. And now when you understand the basics, then you know, okay, it's about these fluctuations. And when you see the fluctuations in the brain area, then you need to know how to change this brain activation to get this instability there as well, to change this. And this is what we started now. Uh, uh, this was a group from uh, Lithuania with um, Alpha Vainoas. They had the same in the heart area. And we started to combine the interaction between heart and, and brain. And we see that every method has a different effect on heart-brain interaction. So when you really understand the basis as a physicist, then you know where to go to and how to change the frequency. I mean, actually, one of, the, of your arguments no, is that repeating the same exact movement as there are no fluctuations variability, it doesn't provide any information to the system. So the system cannot learn, isn't it? Yes, right. This is when you have exact, uh, or uh, we would say identical repetitions. And this was a very big step just three years later uh, after the first publication that we saw actually when you are repeating, you always have also these fluctuations which means actually that also when you are repeating, you are learning by the differences, but you're learning in an unconscious way. And this is actually why I would say little children are learning that fast because they cannot repeat because they are growing and growing. So by mechanics, everything is changing all the time. Our mind is trying to repeat, but the body is completely different. And this is one of the, um, I would say, um, disadvantage influences of philosophy uh, uh, of Descartes, I think that's why I am. It's not about a mind. We have to look for uh, not only about a mind, it's about a body. The body is reflecting, and this was one of the first approaches which, uh, which I did, that actually we didn't want to initiate experiments where you I would say uh, construct conditions according to your theory. And this is exactly the problem which um, are facing most of the publications still at the moment. From those publications, it's uh, actually a wrong interpretation of the statistics, where you actually only could say, under the assumption 
that my theory is, my hypothesis is, is true, we find a probability for data. And I was coming from physics in the beginning. I was really astonished what kind of statistic was applied in, in sports science. This, this, so, sorry, Wolfgang, this sounds a bit like the same that you were seeing in training, that many times coaches uh, propose situations, constraints, tasks, in order to see what they want, not in order to let them self-organize and have success. Yeah, right. right, and this was already my PhD thesis, 90, uh, that I ob just observed an athlete and we saw the different the, the changes, but no one could describe it uh, biomechanically. And this was the reason why I first developed a method how to verify or to prove what we have seen. And this is uh, the second branch uh, of mine where we developed actually these pattern recognition methods where a, a colleague of mine, uh, Fabian Horst, now uh, made big, big advance, uh, advance with uh, these uh, deep learning nets where we are really able to identify a, a person just by 200 uh, milliseconds of a movement. We identify the emotions, we identify the grade of fatigue. And, and meanwhile, we see that they are also reacting very individually on uh, dependent on the intervention. And this is actually what, what I saw in the beginning. Uh, when you give an instruction to 20 athletes, you will have 20 different uh, responses. So it doesn't make sense that the coach has everything in mind. Uh, it has to be an, an interaction. And this was the reason why we suggested already 2003, 2004 it was published, this stochastic resonance uh, thing where the, the, movements, uh, the movement variation of an athlete can be described by a certain amount of noise. And then the coach is coming in and is giving some exercises which can be described also with a certain amount of noise. And those two have to be adjusted to each other. So you have a resonance to signals which have to be attuned to each other, and then you get the maximum learning rate. And I just heard a podcast from, from America where they exactly describe the same, just with other words. They are trying to avoid differential learning, but actually it is exactly differential learning, what they are describing. And this has been described already 20 years ago. But okay, maybe it was my fault uh, because I'm coming from physics and it was a kind of abstract language. But the second thing which I didn't know is because I studied pedagogy, I knew all the, I would say, streamings and teaching methods from pedagogy as well. So I was very well uh, familiar with reform pedagogy. So reform pedagogy already suggested to focus more on the athlete to adjust between both and to keep the system open, to let them play and to find their own structure. And this is actually what I also told uh, Duarte Rouge 2003 in, in Portugal. And this is what actually is the main thing in this approach. But what I meanwhile have seen is that the Anglo-Saxonian area, they didn't know about pedagogy uh, very deeply. So there is a very nice article written in 1999 where they wrote, why is there no pedagogy in, uh, uh, in England? And there I became aware that mainly in, uh, I would say in, in mainland uh, Europe, we had a very different development in pedagogy than in the Anglo-Saxonian area. Nonetheless, John Dewey, the, the big philosopher from the United States, he was a, a part of this uh, reform pedagogy and he has cited this already. And this is actually my, or this was one of my approaches in the beginning. Okay, in order to find something new, you need to know what exists already. Now, if you don't know what's existing, then you are, I would say, you are the inventor of a wheel. But sorry, this has been invented some thousand years ago. Uh, and this is mainly, you should know what exists and you should do really uh, basic research. And this is what I very often say, as a researcher, you need to go to the origin and don't interpret secondary and tertiary literature. Okay, and most people now are coming to the origin, to differential learning, uh, and see that the others are, I would say, only poor copies. 
Okay, but do you think that for because for example for me in the first the first impression I had of differential learning was like oh this abstract uh, language surprised me a bit. No, how can uh, Wolfgang link sto st uh, stochastic resonance, noise, signal with all these these export contexts or situations? So now in order to to have it clear, I would like that usually in the podcast if the guest say something that my dad doesn't understand my dad later comes to me and, and asks to me so now i would like you if possible to explain to somebody like my dad how do you link with differential learning st a statistic resonance signal and noise and what is it to put it in more common terms okay by the way uh, this was not um, all the time uh, the same because Actually, I clearly separated uh, the differential learning in practice from differential learning in theory. Because, okay, I knew um, physics terminology is very abstract, and okay. you, need, you need to translate this into athlete terms. But as I told you, I applied this already with my athlete for more than 15 years before I started to develop the theory for this. And this is the reason why many people only begin to understand uh, this, uh, the theory when they get the practice in reality. And this is what happened actually with, with Natalia in uh, Balaga in, in Barcelona. She invited me. We met each other in 1997 in Copenhagen and we started a discussion. And she invited me to Barcelona to explain this already. I think it was 1999 or 2000. So all those uh, students and coaches who participated there, they were immediately uh, convinced of this. One of those were, were Paco Seulo. Uh, there were a couple of other uh, Spanish coaches, uh, which are in the meantime were quite successful with this. Uh, and this is a completely different language. Okay, now uh, let's try to do it. Okay, we do it with elderly normally uh, uh, in the example of walking. Now, when you walk, no step is the same. So the best, uh, you, you feel this when you go across a field and not in the, or in a pedestrian zone in, in Barcelona, when you have these, these stones. It's okay. Everything is different. Now you can do um, it by changing the coordination or you can cause the variation by the environment, by the surrounding. Okay, and when you want to vary this uh, with your movement, then you can walk on the toes. You can walk on the on the heel. You can swing the arms with extended elbows. Then you can swing the right elbow extended, the left elbow bent, uh, the opposite. Then you can switch every second time. Then you can combine the right uh, heel, uh, walking on the right heel, right extended elbow, left extend, uh, flexed arm, uh, walking on the toe right, and switch this uh, after every four. Then you can turn the head to the left, turn the head to the uh, right. You can uh, circle the head doing the whole way. And this is all related to neurophysiology because we have a lot of reflexes here in the neck and they need to be decoupled from the other things. And this is what you very often see in little children when they start to learn walking and you tell them, watch over there, they stumble. Okay, when you are as an adult, you shouldn't stumble. Uh, so this is what you have learned during your life normally, that you start to decouple these reflexes. But you only can decouple these reflexes when you vary all the time, because when you vary, it's always a mix between contraction and relaxation. And this is going back to brain theory again, because the uh, most frequent uh, transmitter in, in, in the brain is GABA, gamma amino butter acid, and this is an inhibitor. So we are mainly learning by inhibiting things. And this is what you, what you see in little children. When you give them a toy, they not only grip for this toy, the whole body is reacting. Now, when I would give you a toy and your whole body would react, I would say uh, something is wrong here. Uh, you need to, to train some. So it's mainly to learn 
to recover the to to uh, inhibit the rest and just to move the right arm towards the toy. And this learning to inhibit in the right moment is one of the biggest elements of coordination. And you only learn this with a lot of variations. And actually, uh, I would say everyone knows this because this is what little children use all the time. For example, when you learn a, uh, a language, uh, we have an, an, in German, we have a, a, a quote. Uh, it's called three Chinese are learning uh, with a contrabass. And then you, you speak this only with an E, then you speak the whole only with an E, with an I, then with an A, and then with an U, and then so trash and nasman contrabass, trosho nosen contrabass. So you are varying all the time in order to make the language stable. And this is actually why languages should be taught by singing. Because when you sing, you have much more variation. And there's an additional advantage that when music is included, then it's a completely different, um, I would say, storage in the brain. So I would say very easy language for your father or your grandfather is remember them to children's game. This is where they did differential learning. So what I understood is that you would propose them many variations, many different ways of walking through the street in order that they learn what's important to inhibit, what's important to move to, to, to control their body. It's yeah, this is one thing, but the other thing is uh, to uh, stay adaptive. Because what, what's okay. happening and, and I feel is already okay with increasing age, your body is changing. Okay, I would say costly performance is decreasing. But it's decreasing slower when you are keeping the system always active. And yeah, okay, this is what I did, by the way, in, in Barcelona a couple of times. Um, uh, at the beach, I walk backwards. Walking backwards, okay, you always have to, to look where, where there is some, someone. Uh, but you also can walk in, in uh, like a snake. You can walk fast and slow. There's also uh, already uh, a challenge. Or when, when it's very crowded in the pedestrian zone Barcelona, try to get through the pedestrian zone as fast as possible. So you have to stop and, and, and look and watch and um, to find different, to, to challenge yourself all the ways for new things. And this is also nothing new. This has been said already in the 70s, 1970s, with uh, cybernetic pedagogy where they said you need to uh, keep the information on a higher level, but it's about the subjective information. When you're repeating, the subjective information is getting lower and lower and lower. So in order to keep your learning rate on a higher level, you need to vary all the time, and then you, your brain sees the necessity to adapt and to stay on learning. Actually, correct me, please, if I'm wrong, I think that with differential learning, what you say is that we don't learn by repeating, but what differential learning teaches you is to constantly adapt, to constantly learn and a little bit apply what you learn, no? Yes, right. Uh, but coming back to repetition, uh, we know, meanwhile, some situations where repetition is helpful. Uh, my classical example, you see, meanwhile, I like uh, to have uh, metaphors with little children. What I very often say in, in my lectures is, okay, what are we doing with little children when we bring them to bed? Okay, very often we read books to them. And very often the children are asking for specific books, which they know. Okay, and this makes sense because they know what is going to happen so they can relax and it's necessary to relax, to fall asleep. Yes, in this case, it's right. And I very often ask my uh, siblings, what happens when you visit your friends and you bring a new toy, a friend in the evening, and you bring to the children a new toy? The children will stay awake yeah. until midnight, at least. 
Okay? So to become awake, actually, you need something new. Now, what we say, meanwhile, when someone is psychologically stable, then we can vary in the motoric area quite a bit. But when someone is here in the psychological area instable, then they want to have the repetitions to get a safety here, which is no problem for me. But then you should be honest and say, okay, it's more a psychological thing and it's not about motor learning. You cannot separate this. This is always uh, together, but this brought us to the idea why the frontal lobe is that important for our learning. And what we meanwhile see is, okay, when you give critics feedback, the, the frontal brain is activated and is blocking actually the access to, to the mot uh, somatic and motor area. So it's mainly about opening this frontal area. And fortunately, I would say, or luckily, uh, we, we did this from, from the beginning by not giving in, uh, corrections. We just gave the next, next, next. And actually, it, it's, I would say, the same what you do with children. When a children is walking in the wrong way, you don't correct them. Just lift them up and they walk, walk uh, uh, ahead. So I never saw parents explaining or correcting children while walking. And this is the best way to learn. I, I agree, but so one day we, with one similar metaphor, one day one another professional asked me, but what about when we walk, that maybe it's a natural process that we learn, but when we are learning a sport a skill, that maybe it's not like, how to say it, natural in nature. It's the same process. I don't know if I explained yeah. well the, the point. Okay. Simply, yes. You want to have more explanations for this? <laughs> Uh, no, no, I, I agree. No, I agree. No, no, in learning, in learning, and this is uh, psychology and pedagogy, there are different learning theories. Okay. Uh, the most people know behaviorism, where everything is coming from outside. And by the way, this is what's going to happen at the moment that uh, a lot of uh, colleagues are suggesting you have to modify the environment and um, look for some invitations out there. This is nothing else than behaviorism. The belief that we can control everything from outside. Okay, and then there is learning by role model, but there's also learning by insight. If you understand something or learning by trial and error. So there are different ways to learn, which are well known in, in uh, psychology for long. But unfortunately, most are focusing on um, role model and behaviorism the so, environment they, the environment is trending nowadays yeah right because it <laughs> gives the coach the feeling i can control the situation uh, for me it's nothing else than uh, renovation of, of behaviorism i can control everything from outside and actually this is not uh, i would say an the equality of of uh, uh, the athlete and the environment. No, uh, actually, I would say it's uh, an asymmetry towards the individual because the individual is choosing what is coming in and the individual can change, can adapt. The environment cannot. And on the other side, uh, for me, it's also an, an educational thing. When you do all, all things from outside, I think this, the learner is never taking over uh, the responsibility. And this was always uh, a very, I would say, major point in differential learning by allowing them to find a solution by themselves. You are actually giving them self-confidence and in parallel, you're developing tolerance uh, because they learn that it's my solution and the other has a different solution. I don't have to fight. Mine is better than this. There are different ways. And this was one of the beginning, uh, actually, in differential learning, that I said, okay, there are different ways to roam. Let's just show that they are equal. Okay, now, just by chance, uh, it turned out that it seems differential learning has some advantages. But uh, yeah. there, uh, just going back, and, and one, of idea, one of the ideas was, how do you learn bicycle riding? 
Is there anyone who can explain to you, okay, you have to contract the quadriceps by 80%, uh, 45 degrees in this direction? No. You try it, you fell down a couple of times, but all the things which you learned by yourself, you never forget. And although you wouldn't ride a bicycle for several years, you would still be able to ride a bicycle. And this is actually what I wanted to cause by differential training as well. This aha learning. Okay, all of a sudden, okay, now I got it. And the second question was all the time, who was the teacher of the first? The first had to discover it by himself. And they typically made a revolution. And this is Fosbury Flop was one. He was trying all the things and all of a sudden, okay, and he was uh, the best for, for a long time. The same was with O'Brien technique, the same uh, now with the rotational technique, the same was with ski uh, jumping. Uh, in the beginning, the V uh, position, they were laughing about him. Meanwhile, everyone is, is uh, doing this. So it's always the first who did these experiments to find the optimal solution. The, I think this is a very interesting point. Because I don't know, I would say that the Fosbury Flop project, maybe it's a bit more behaviorist, you no, know, focusing all the time on the environment, on this relationship. And I have seen that differential learning or most of your research. I wouldn't, I don't know if you would agree more contractivist, but what I see is that you put a lot of focus on individuality as a main, you no, know, a little bit the same as you were saying that when you examined the role models, on when you gave a tip to your group of 20 students, all of them had a different uh, reply. And I think, and here, honestly, I don't have a clear answer, but if we look to the Fosbury flop case, I think with Dick Fosbury, it was very important that he, his individual history, wasn't feeling great jumping with, with the West uh, straddle technique. Straddle technique, yeah. But then also that the you know that this individuality is very important. But then he could express that individuality because a change in the environment, no, in the rules. Yeah, it was um, also the the mat was was invented. Yeah, uh, they there were no more landing on 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 sand, so it became much softer. And this was, by the way, also the reason uh, why pole vaulting uh, changed changed a lot. Uh, there but for me it's okay there are some uh, conditions but you can change the environment if you don't change nothing will happen yeah and, and although uh, this has been uh, i would say offered to all different people it was him who uh, took the the, the chance uh, and and um, actually he took advantage of this he was able to adjust but it was his creativity yes Yes, yes. For, and no, what, and what, I don't know. Actually, this is what you actually very often see in, in gymnasts. So a gymnast, okay, you have a high bar. But what can you do with a high bar? It's, it's not, for me, an invitation of the high bar. It's always about, yeah. okay, challenge the thing. Okay, I can do this salt, and I can do a ging salt, and I can do this. And, and uh, then every name is actually mirroring that those people were creative. But don't you think that, for example, the, and, and I completely agree that, as you said, no, many skills are person dependent and time dependent, no? Like, but for example, I was wondering last day I was watching in Twitter and I saw a map of the of the 100 faster runners of 10K in athletics. And I was seeing that all of them were from Kenya and from Ethiopia. And, and I was like, okay, I have to ask this to, to Wolfgang. Like, and, and here, honestly, I'm not defending uh, the environment, not individuality, but my question is that I see that in any context or my perception is that it's like each one of them mixes or has different degree of importance. I don't know. Well, um you never can uh, separate environment from the individual. But this is, I would say, a very old thing. This is what you see already in Newton laws. Gravitation is the force between two bodies. But there you see already the problem. Um, 
three bodies is already too much to calculate in an easy way. It needed about 200 years to get a solution for, for this. So there, it was never a separation, but it's more about which system is adaptive. Okay, the runners are mainly from Ethiopia and, and uh, long distance runners from Ethiopia and, and Kenya. Uh, this has clear environmental influence because um, I've been to Ethiopia um, uh, and uh, was investigating these uh, training camps. And yes, Addis Abeba is already in, in a height of 2000 meters, uh, which is changing your metabolism in principle. Uh, and then when, when, when you watch their training, they have an enormous amount of people which are running, I would say very rarely on the street. They're mainly in the countryside, up and down, uh, cross and, and whatever. And when you have a big amount of people, then I would say it's just a probability that you will get better runners. Okay, and, and I would expect if someone uh, grew up in, in, in Mexico and when they have, uh, uh, it's also very high, uh, yes. and when they would have a corresponding supporting system, it would be the same. I never said, okay, we have to change running. It is forward, and I don't think that anyone will change to run on, on the hands or run backwards. We approximately know the area of solution, but within this, biomechanics says, okay, we have infinity, infinite different possibilities. So it's, it's always about, okay, you have to find your own optimum. It's not about finding a, a completely new technique. It's about you. And then it was always a side effect that by looking for these variations, you stay adaptive and you will progress. And by doing this, and this is an, the advantage when you go in, in, in a group, uh, the others will be in, inspired as well. They are inspiring you. And this was, by the way, one of the, the beginning, uh, which I said in, in, in differential learning. Okay, I will show you one exercise and you give me two other variants of this. Okay, you give me two variants and I have to find a variant of your variant. So what you read in, in classic literature is mainly satisfying the old needs because at this moment, science wanted to have everything clear, uh, uh, reproducible. So they forced us to give exact these instruction, instruction, instruction. And now they are turning it upside down and say, uh, differential learning is giving instructions. No, it's not. It's only the beginning. It was the beginning. And this is what I said already 2003 in, in Barcelona uh, to 200 football coaches uh, uh, about this game. You have to decide how the uh, catcher has to move. It's about creativity, uh, causing creativity. So I would say it, it was mainly a, a mean interpretation of, of uh, differential learning in order to have a possibility to find something which is outside of this. No, it, it, it was never. Because uh, coming back to differential learning, now let's imagine me as a paddle or tennis or, or basketball coach. Yes. Which, ti which tips would you give me in order to start implementing it? Uh, I would try to start with your knowledge about classical learning. Okay, in classical learning, you are looking for errors. And then the coach is telling you uh, what you have to change. Okay, you can stay with this, but instead of reducing the error, you have to increase the error. Okay, and when they are increasing this error, they show another error. But we don't call this error. It's a fluctuation. Because when you're talking about error, you pretend to know what is correct. And actually, I don't know any coach who knows this correct. Okay, we approximately know in which area the solution will be, approximately. But still, there are uh, much more possibilities than we believe. So basically, proposing to the players uh, fluctuations, different ways of doing the movements, different constraints. Uh, okay, now one one word to to the term constraints. Uh, constraints is in the English language used as a synonym for boundary conditions. 
Okay, but there's a big disadvantage with this term constraints. You always have a connotation. Okay, now you can use a, a constraint to establish something. Okay, I can tell you, do whatever you want. This is a constraint. So by doing, by telling you this, you're no more allowed to do what another, what another is saying or what you read in a book. It's constraining you because it's establishing you in a moment for this. But I also can tell you, you have to walk on a line, you have to breathe in this rhythm, you have to, you're constraining, you're limiting, restricting the thing. And this is a, a kind of mix up. So I just was in a conference in, in, in Portugal and meanwhile, they really say, if you're talking about constraints, actually you don't know nothing. You know nothing because you don't need to use this word. You can say it concretely. Okay, uh, which boundary conditions do you mean? And by the way, this is also a, a type of, I would say, new science. Originally in physics, and it's uh, in, in philosophy as well, we were talking about boundary conditions, which have to be mentioned in order to be able to repeat a, a study. Then the psychologist came and said, uh, let's talk about context. And then another guy came and said, uh, actually, a new word, constraint, sounds better. But actually, they are all talking about the same. Uh, yes, you, you can change the situation. You can change the boundary conditions. You can change it with the body. You can change it with the environment. You can change it with the mind. Uh, the major thing is that you have to, I would say, you know, in a more complicated way, you have to stay on the same subjective information level. Okay, you can grip in a different way. You can uh, hit the uh, with the extended elbow. You can change the position related to, to how you hit the ball. You can change uh, the forward or backward position. You can open the left or, or the right eye. You can exhale during, you can inhale during the things. Uh, you can cry when, uh, you, while you're doing this. So for me, it was mainly about having variation, differences, causing differences. Okay, where the difference are coming from, you have to find. And a major part in the beginning was actually, I wanted to foster coaches to become more experimental. Don't believe everything what is written down. And this has been expressed already by Schopenhauer, a German philosopher. If you read a lot, you only learn to think with other people's head. And what's mainly happening is that most of the, I would say, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, scientists, they are just parroting other things without un having understood what's behind this. The, and then, completely clear. And then once I propose this difference, I just think this level of, of varying the subject disinformation, you also recommend not to give instructions in order to let the subject self-organize. I don't know if, if you agree. I thought that self-organization was like the result of the, all the constraints or boundary conditions, no? as it could be opponents, ball, position in the court, and also coach instructions. But you defend to not give instructions to let the individual self-organize? No. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I would say it's trivial that you need to change the constraints for learning process. Because already when the athlete has learned something, that he has changed his constraints. So it's actually trivial. It was never about to change something. It was always about how often in which way we have to change. So you see this already in methodical series of exercise. You see this in variability of practice. You see this contact. All was about change. Okay, they were, I would say, not on the completely wrong, but uh, very limited way. You have to vary this. So this is nothing new. This is absolutely trivial. 
okay, what we said in the beginning is when we give instructions, we give unpredicted stochastic instructions. So change the shoulder, change this, change this, change this. But it was within a discipline, within shot put. It was not everything goes. No, it was within put, shot put. And concretely in this case, actually I told in the beginning the athlete to, to perform all the movements which I have seen as so-called errors in all the different national teams. Okay, and by giving this noise, you're telling nothing about what is correct. So it's not an instruction what to do to do it correctly. It's a way of giving noise to the system that the noise has a chance to find its own solution. And this is self-organization. So we are giving the noise in a diffuse way. But when you are limiting the system, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do this, then you are guiding the system and this is no self-organization anymore. Then self-organization is just a buzzword uh, because it's a big fashion in, in, in physics without having understood what's going on there. Okay, in, in a more uh, recent uh, paper I, I wrote about guided self-organization. But this is, okay, when we see a shot putter in an in advanced state, we don't need to tell him how to move the hip or whatever, but it's about the internal rhythm. And this is also what I suggested from the beginning. With a beginner, we are varying the geometry. Do the shot put to the left, to the right, uh, move the elbow in this direction, do, do it with the extender. But on the higher level, you vary the velocity. Okay, start fast and slow. Slow, fast, slow. Or the hip is fast, the shoulder is slow, the, the arm is uh, fast again. So we focus the noise in another area, but it's still noise. We don't tell them exactly what to do. So it's putting noise around the problematic area. And then it's a self-organizing in this area, a self-organization in this area as well. And it's not, it's not uh, giving all the time instructions. It's an interaction. Okay, I give you an instruction and then you should give me, the athlete should give me a possibility as well. Or what do you think? And this is what actually we described in the stochastic resonance system as well. So when you have too much noise, when the athlete is too risky, then you need to reduce the noise as a coach. But when they are repeating too much, then you need to increase the noise. So depending on the noise of the athlete, you need to adjust from outside. And this is meant by attuning to signals to resonance. The coach has to completely understood, like the coach, the coach has to read and be aware in order to adjust these noise or fluctuations, right? Yes. And because I am really interested and I think about how to implement it, but then I see many players, the ones that I coach, that are used to a completely different kind of, of tasks. So here I'm going to ask, what was your experience with your group of athlete, athletes when you started to propose different ways of, of training? Well, this is, uh, I would say, also a, a developing process. And this is also included in, I would say, this uh, dynamic systems principle. So when you have a new idea, it does make sense to, um, I would say, immediately come up with a complete new thing. So actually, it's it's how can I change the athlete's mind. Okay, first I need to understand his way of thinking. And then I'm looking for different, I would say fluctuations in their comments, talking. And this is what we, we uh, why we apply this in um, consultancy as well. So I'm talking slowly in a different language to them and I'm challenging them in different motivational type. Okay, I don't think that you are able to do this. If he's competition oriented, he will go for this. Okay, but some, a lot of athletes are not competition oriented. They need to be motivated by someone else. Okay, and this is, by the way, a, a very interesting um, 
area which we are trying to bring together. It's this action type model uh, from uh, uh, Bertrand Terula from and, and Ralf Hippolyte from Swiss and, and French, where they really can tell you about different motivational types. And dependent on the motoric um, preferences, you need to talk to the athlete in a completely different way. And this is what we are trying to combine at the moment. Uh, and it's again more individual, which is, I would say, shifting the preferences even more to the individual in comparison to the environment. Because dependent on you, you have to change, I would say, the environment. And this is independent of whether it's in Soviet Union or uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia or in Africa. Uh, it's dependent on the in individual. And what about, for example, when it comes in order to play uh, collective games? What is this super clear? And I think we still have to talk about all the benefits proven of differential learning in order to learn complex uh, motor skills. But what about when, for example, in order it comes to football, when also it's very uh, important the interaction with your teammates and opponents. There's also room for differential learning, how to apply it. There is lo a, a lot of uh, room to, to apply this there. This is, by the way, what, what I uh, discussed with Paco Seulo 2000 in Barcelona already. Uh, and a lot of coaches um, had, had benefit of this. Uh, it's again the same. When you see um, a team playing, they have certain fluctuations. Uh, or the coach would say they move in the wrong way. These are errors. Now, again, it's the same. Instead of telling them how to move correctly, move them or, or yeah move them in a completely wrong direction so they need to experience the consequence immediately and this is a very old pedag pedagogical saying children only learn from consequences so you have to create a situation where they have the chance to immediately feel the consequence okay you can stay sideways to your opponent to the left shoulder, to the right shoulder, which is a big difference, uh, dependent on your action type. Uh, you should stay symmetrically, you should stay very close, or you should stay away. Some need to stay close. If you don't know about the motor preferences of your athlete, you need some experiments. But you need to try this. The same with tactics. Uh, as a handball player, I was used uh, to play different defense and offense systems. Okay. We played 6-0, we played 4-2, we played 5-1, uh, we played 3-3. And for me, at, at this time already, the interesting part was, in a team, you should be unpredictable for your opponent. Because then you have a higher chance to win, to score a goal. Okay, and unpredictable mean, meant for us, we should immediately be able to change between 6-0, 4-2, or 5-1. Okay, whistle this, whistle this. And this is what is happening more and more in football. I saw this with Toshel and, and, and Nagelsmann as well, uh, that they are switching between 4 4 3 to 5 3 uh, 1 uh, to all different systems within one game. They should be able to do this. And I would say a very extreme version uh, was um, recommended by Cruyff already, but uh, actually the original idea was uh, coming, I think, from Merkel. Uh, it's uh, complete uh, foot, total football, where every player should be able to play in every uh, in every position. And then I would say you are the most unpredictable uh, predictable team. And then you should also be able to switch in the rhythm. Okay, when uh, when you go all all the time uh, offense, very aggressive, you need to have some time to recover. So you need to keep the ball to be able to recover from the metabolism. I never saw a team who was able to go aggressive for 90 minutes. You need to cope with this. And this could be trained in a, in a, uh, already in a training process. So let's be only the, the front row aggressive. Then let's be uh, only the mid row aggressive, the rear uh, zone aggressive. Uh, you can say, okay, in this zone you're aggressive, in this zone you're passive. Uh, you can do this in, in, in different areas. So there are a lot of, 
I would say, even more possibilities uh, to apply differential learning there. But this is the belief that we should break, no? That uh, fluctuations, variability, it's something good in order with the team patterns, with individual patterns. I'm not going to say that degeneracy no. because I know. No, again, uh, it, it is just a possibility. Now, in a, I would say in a team, you always have people who need security, safety. And those needs have to be satisfied as well. So, okay, let's play constantly for these players. But what you see more and more is that also the defense players are becoming much more aggressive. When you, when you look to the, the Bavarian uh, Davis, he's one of the, the fastest, uh, I think, uh, left-wing players uh, to, together with, with Koma. Uh, so you need to adjust this to the, I would say, psychology to the characteris characteristics of the players. And then you need to vary. But I would say a very important part is already to show the athletes that every player is different to become tolerant. And we know from action type, meanwhile, okay, there are some people who prefer horizontal playing, the others prefer more this. So you have to position them. They prefer to get diagonal pass, they give diagonal pass. The other ones, they prefer to get these uh, line passes. When you know about this player, then you can adjust your pass and it's much easier to handle the ball with uh, with these things. But you need to vary the things. If the team needs safety, yes, I would say repeat. But I think one of the worst things is when they are getting to the lower area of, of the table, increase and repeat. Because we know that differential learning has an enormous effect on the brain, on variation. And we know really when... It's too much repetition with combined with too much ambitious. Then it's getting a disease. As we, always, adjust, no? They need to adjust and adapt well dystonia. to the individual. We get focal dystonia. We get uh, Parkinson. Parkinson has an enormous need for control. It's an overactivation of the frontal lobe. And we see this already in the first studies. When we did, when we did differential walking, we see already a reduction in symptoms. And this is where we are, are doing our research at the moment. Golfan, uh, I hear, I heard you and I know the success you had like applying differential learning with your athletes. Professional coaches like Tuchel also apply it and had success. There is a uh, full of papers on science that prove the benefits. But I still feel that differential learning or its methods are not uh, widely accepted or implemented on on the common or the actual training methodologies. What else is missing? Like, what do we we need to do? Like, well, um, I would say yes. It was one of my problems that I didn't publish in the corresponding papers. Uh, but to be honest. Um, I only publish things which I have verified. When I see the other approach, concretely ecological dynamics, it's only opinion papers, it's uh, beliefs, it's theoretical discussion, but I never saw concrete, practical applications there. And yes, this group has spread a lot because they did a lot of marketing in, in, in this area. <laughs> But I never saw that this has been applied sex successfully in teams. When you look to, to social media in the meantime, you see that they got frustrated with constraints approach. And immediately when, when they start with differential learning, they have much more progress than the last 20 years with any other approach. And this is increasing more and more. Uh, so I think it's just a question of time when the athletes will uh, understand this. And another thing is what I've experienced in Austria and, and uh, some other countries, a lot of coaches are applying differential learning. Without knowing it. They don't talk about it because they say, it's my secret. And if the others know it as well, they're becoming better than me. In my, in my surroundings, I have the feeling that if I propose to some of my uh, coach mates in the club 
to coach like this, they would tell me that, okay, science says that, whatever, but they would reject it just because I think in their mindset, they still coach from a point of view that they have all the answers, that they have to tell the player what is right and what is wrong. Yeah, but I would say this is a classical thing. This was uh, all the time. And I can, can understand this because actually, I would say a lot of uh, scientists are very arrogant to tell, okay, this is, for me, it's never, it is the way. You see that all our publications uh, are providing something new and are, uh, I would say, reflecting on the old and we have to modify the, the other things as well. I, I'm offering this things okay when they ask for this i explain this um very often i'm invited uh, for practical courses if they take it it's it's fine for me i help them if they don't take it i think okay the time is not right for them <laughs> i don't want to con convince anyone uh, it's an offer you can use it and to be honest it's not only tushy Uh, you see uh, a lot of thing, uh, the things in, in Guardiola's training. You see a lot of things in Klopp. He was also in the former times a student of mine. His co-coach uh, does all the re rehabilitation in a differential uh, way. Uh, Nagelsmann uh, has applied this. So there are a lot of coaches who are applying this, but they do don't talk about it. You only hear it in an indirect way when the athletes, for example, in, in, in Mainz, when Tuchel was, uh, was a coach in Mainz, no one knew about this. Until one athlete said, in order to cope with Togel's training, you need to study. It's that complicated. Uh, it's really a challenge for the brain. And I just thought, okay, now it's on the right way. And I see this more and more. And a lot of people are applying this, uh, I would say, in terms of variation training, which would not have been possible 20 years ago. When I came up with this the first time, They almost have killed me. Now, meanwhile, uh, some guy, uh, I think it's also from, from Munich, he's calling this brain training. Uh, another one is calling this, uh, I think, life kinetics. It's nothing else than variation of, of uh, it's a poor copy of differential training. And they are selling very good. Yes, this actually has yes, maybe, this is my error. Uh, I don't want to sell the things. And maybe this is the reason why it's not spread that much or as you would have uh, expected this do you think that in the future differential learning will uh, win popularity because it will be helpful to coaches that individuality will be every time much more important to be considered uh, i see this already uh, to my uh, experience it's almost exploding Uh, at the moment, uh, in, in Portugal, I've seen a lot of coaches. They asked me, uh, they invited me uh, to come there to do this uh, from the United States. A um, uh, coach from uh, Jiu Jitsu applied this. Uh, Californian coach for beach volleyball uh, is uh, applying this. It's applied more and more. And for me, it's actually, I would say, almost a contradiction. If I would say this is the way and, and I have to go to politicians and they have to say no it's uh, I would say when it's going to happen then it's a revolution from the bottom so the athletes will do this the coaches will do this and later I think the theory will adjust correspondingly by the way differential learning is already in a lot of, of textbooks discussed not in the right way But this is what I always complain as well. They know that where the differential learning is coming from. But instead of asking me and initiating a discussion, they start to integrate this in a very, very weird way and complain about the things. There are a lot of things which I never have said, which are associated with, with uh, differential learning. One guy from, from America says, okay, this approach is like you are uh, in a buffet and you can choose whatever you want. And my approach is, no, I am in the breakfast because it's, no, it's, it started in high performance sports. You cannot tell them to take the buffet. No, it's out of the breakfast. Uh, you have to look for this corn and, and from this season and all the details. But the same theory works for the other things as well. So, yeah, okay. 
if you don't want to understand, I cannot help. Do you and, and related to this, do you think we pay in the our training methodologies nowadays enough attention to individual? I once heard your anecdote with Matveyev and Stalin about the principle of individuality, and I think that it would still be valid nowadays in most of the countries. Yes, it is. Um, by the way, we we are facing the age of individuality, which will go for more than 2000 years. Um, but for me, the problem at the moment is, and this is going to happen very often in the beginning, that individuality is mixed up with egoism. Egoism is uh, living on costs of others. Individuality uh, is living for himself, but uh, we accept the others as well. It's uh, actually developing more uh, tolerance. And it's not about, okay, uh, I have to be in front and I'm the best and, and, and the greatest and I need more money and, and, and all these things. Uh, individuality, in, in, I would say, in the poor sense. Golfan, uh, thank you very much. I've enjoyed a lot and I still have uh, many questions, but I think it would be better instead of keep annoying you to invite you another day if you want to come. I just would like to, to close it with one last question that I was impressed with your honesty when you said that when you were young, you were continuously asking yourself what to change what did you need to improve in order to do better and be better than others to continue progressing with your methods and with your players and my question was do, do you still ask yourself this nowadays which steps do you have nowadays in order to keep improving to keep helping people yes for sure uh, i would say this character cannot be changed uh, the thing which I'm talking about here is mainly, I would say, for me, 20 years old. So the things which which we are looking for at the moment are, um, I'm, uh, I mentioned this already, are more in the health area, how to apply this in Parkinsonian or in multiple sclerosis, how to uh, combine this with dancing, shaman dancing, uh, where we have certain frequencies in the brain with two hertz. And what we see meanwhile in, in brain science, that this is highly dependent on magnetic fields. And okay, I'm a physicist, uh, where are the magnetic fields coming from? And then we see a real, I would say, ecological approach, that actually our brain is always manipulated by fluctuations of the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth's magnetic field is highly dependent on the sun wind, and the sun wind is highly dependent on planet constellations. And then you are actually preaching a completely different science. And this is one reason why I went to China and to India every year. I, I do this uh, to get their thinking. And this is what we, we discovered already, that by applying differential training, we get similar brain states as we see in meditation or in, after yoga. And this is actually for me um, a verification that we are on the right way. It's always about our brain state. How can we cause this? Um, what type of movement does a single individual need in order to get this uh, brain state? And also how much variation does the individual need to get this brain state to get to the highest performance? So actually I have I would say I this for the next hundred years thank you very much Golgan for coming and for all your lessons maybe okay. they change your words maybe they change they, they interpreted them in another ways but I think that the best person you will have is to see as coaches in few years or decades uh, coach according I, to the to the lessons you to your lessons i would hope that your podcast is causing a lot of people to think about and coming back to my uh, language if your podcast is causing fluctuations in your audience brain 
then you are successful. Of thanks course, but it will be without any doubt. Thanks for thanks to guests like you. Thank you, Volkan. I wish you the best. Thanks. And you too. Bye.